Hello everyone and welcome to my full conversation with Federico Fagin. Federico is the inventor of the microprocessor, founder of two companies, Zilog and Synaptics, which we talk more about in this conversation. Federico is the recipient of the 2009 National Medal of Innovation and Technology, which was awarded to him by President Barack Obama. As if that isn't enough, Federico is currently funding the study of consciousness through his foundation, the Federico and Elvia Fagin Foundation. Personally, he is embarking on quite a rigorous study of consciousness in his own life, and he has a theory of consciousness that reshapes the way in which we view our entire universe. In this conversation, we talk about Federico's journey to inventing the microprocessor, some of the difficulties that he encountered along the way, and what led him to studying consciousness currently. Stay tuned to the end of the conversation to hear Federico discuss his definition of success and how that's changed in his life. Enjoy my conversation with Federico Fagin. Hello everyone, today I am in the heart of Silicon Valley in California and I'm speaking with Federico Fagin. So thank you so much for joining me today, Federico. I'm wondering if you can describe a bit of your educational background. Um, what, what did you study in school? A little bit more about that. Okay, well I was born and raised and educated in Italy. Vicenza is the town where I was born. Um, I went to um, first to technical high school and then I went to university, University of Padua, where Galileo Galilei taught mm -hmm. <laughs> back in, you know, toward the end of the 1500s. And uh, um, so I study physics, which is really uh, my passion. Okay. And did you ever have a period where you weren't really sure what you wanted to do with your studies, with your degree? You didn't know the direction that you wanted to take it? Well, uh, actually, the general direction, no. Because mm -hmm. since I was four, I decided that um, machines, I like machines because I can understand machines. I cannot understand people. They are mean sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. machines, I can understand it. And if you understand it, they're not mean to you. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you always so, had that motivation. So that motivation yeah. was, uh, you know, was, was there. And I love uh, airplanes and so on. So I fell in love with the, the first model plane that I saw when yeah. I was 11. And I decided to build one myself, yeah. which eventually I did, uh, you know, a few months later. So that was, that was the, the, the start, and then later on I wanted to understand more deeply how, how things actually work, how, mm -hmm. how does this world work, how yeah. is it put together, and that's why I chose physics instead of uh, engineering. Engineering okay. would have been more, you know, more appropriate for my interest also in building things, okay. uh, in designing and building things, but, but I, I had a deeper uh, need to understand how things actually work. And you had that driving sense of curiosity yeah. your whole life. Yeah, that's okay. right. And physics was, you know, really was at the heart of that question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering if you could take us to, it's 1968, correct? When yes. you developed the technology behind the first microprocessor. Yes. And yeah. can you describe the, the scientists, the engineers that were involved in that discovery? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, you're talking about the, the uh, MOS transistor, uh, which is a device that is using pretty much all of the microelectronics, which is pretty much all of the electronics these days. Uh, in those days, those transistors were made using aluminum gate. The gate is a the control electrode of this uh, device. The device has two other uh, pins, uh, two other uh, points of contact. One is called the source and the other one is called the drain. When you apply a voltage to the gate, you can make current flow between the source and the drain. Okay. And the current may also be interrupted depending on the voltage that you apply to the gate. So mm -hmm. is the ideal device to make a switch. Okay. You know, a switch is simply two wires that touch each other or yeah. not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Except in a switch you use your hands to make the connection. In a, in a integrated circuit, in a transistor, you apply a voltage or you know, different, two different voltages mm -hmm. on the gate of the transistor. So when the voltage is applied, you close the transistor, you close the switch. Mm -hmm. When it's not applied, the, 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 the switch is open. That's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. 
but when you put billions of those transistors together, you can make a very interesting computers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and that's exactly what was at the heart of the digital revolution. However, in those days, the switches were not very good. They they were not fast enough. They were too big, and uh, they consumed too much power. And so the idea was to reduce all the parasitics, you know, all the elements that were taken away from the, fun the pure mm -hmm. function of the switch. Uh, so the most important one was the overlap capacitance between the gate and the source and the drain. Um, and uh, there was an idea that was already advanced by uh, Dr. Bauer to actually uh, make a self-aligned gate, meaning the gate somehow could define the source and okay. the drain. So the in, you know, independent of where the gate was misaligned, you could always have the same source and drain overlap capacitances, and they will be reduced to a minimum. So this idea had been advanced uh, a couple of years earlier. I actually had not heard about it, yeah. but I, I came up with the same idea, okay. and, and, and I, I decided to use uh, polysilicon, uh, actually, instead of aluminum, polysilicon, because the aluminum, which was what the experiment of Bauer later on, I found out it was made with, the, the aluminum could not withstand the high temperature necessary oh, okay. for the process. So, so you could you could just make some experiments show that the, that, that the idea basically worked, but they were not useful unless okay. you could do it in a you know in a manufacturing process. And so, by using polysilicon, it was possible now to create a uh, you know a self-aligned transistor with okay. a silicon gate uh, and. Uh, with that, I was able to achieve about five times the speed for the same oh. power dissipation okay. and half the size of the transistor. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we had a factor of 10 technology much more powerful than mm -hmm. what was there before yeah. for the same cost. Uh, so with this uh, trick, so to speak, it was then possible to put a lot more transistors so you could make a microprocessor yeah. and, and many yeah. other devices. And that technology, it took a little while yeah. for it to be adopted, but, but by, you know, five years later, it was adopted by the entire industry. Mm -hmm. And it was the, basically the technology that allowed all this, you know, uh, enormous, uh, enormous growth mm -hmm. in the technology to occur. In fact, it, it was used up and it's still used today, yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, but there was no other way of doing transistor until the last five years or, you know, eight years when uh, you know as you go smaller and smaller you cannot use the um, the polysilicon and the ox silicon dioxide because they have characteristics that uh, are not sufficient yeah. to increase the uh, performance so so now the transistors of today are much more complex structures okay. but of course they are much smaller which allows to pack more per chip okay. and therefore continue the increase in performance yeah. with time which is you know generally known as Moore's Law. And do you, from the inception of the idea to when it's actually implemented, were there any major um, major struggles that you had where you thought this isn't going to be able to be implemented? There's oh yeah, I mean, you know, that's, uh, for example, the, you know, the original, the original uh, uh, material that, that, that I used was uh, amorphous silicon, silicon mm -hmm. that was deposited uh, in a vacuum chamber. Uh, but that amorphous silicon, actually would break at the oxide steps. Okay. So, so uh, you know, so myself and, uh, and uh, another person, uh, and a, another engineer, uh, uh, Tom Klein, we figured out that by using uh, polysilicon instead of amorphous silicon, we could actually have step coverage, much more step coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, then we found that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, aluminum could also break uh, but then we use a way a way to smooth the oxide by using high level of phosphorus, which were also very important to reduce the contamination of the silicon, the, you know, as a final process before you would seal the entire structure. Okay. So all those tricks were found along the way yeah. that made the, the, the process uh, highly reliable and, uh, and and have all the characteristics that I was telling you before. So, yeah. Yeah. And did you find 
that you had this desire to continually refine and improve your inventions or was there a point when you were thinking okay this is it like I'm going to give this to the world do you do you have a desire to completely you know keep <clears throat> working with it or well uh, I, I had the desire to to for this technology to actually uh, be second to none mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the uh, Virtual Semiconductor in those days was a relatively large company and uh, they were not really that um, that aggressive in using new technology, particularly new technology that was developing their own laboratories. There was a little bit of non-invented here because the laboratories were separate from the main activity of the company. So there was a little bit of finger pointing you know, okay. between, yeah. between the, two, the two areas. And uh, uh, it, you know, it, one of the one of the things that was uh, missing uh, that the engineers in production and in design uh, wanted was, uh, uh, was was what was called the bootstrap bootstrap okay. load. It's a type of it's a type of structure that allows you to uh, achieve an output at, at in a logic gate equal to the uh, to the um, supply voltage. Okay. So if you could do that, you could use certain techniques that would highly simplify the design of logic circuits. Um, uh, that didn't appear possible with the silicon gate because you had to have a nice capacitor, but where you had the polysilicon, you couldn't make, you couldn't have a junction underneath because it was exactly the point to use that as a mask Okay. against the fusion underneath, you know, to make a self-aligned gate. So, so, uh, so that, was, that was a big problem. Okay. Uh, eventually, I was able to figure out how to do it yeah. <laughs> without having to, you know, to, to, to put another, another junction underneath, which would cost money and an extra masking step. In those days, when you had four masking steps to go from four to five, was was considered impossible to do. Yeah. Today, of course, you use thirty masking yeah. layers, <laughs> and nobody f flinches. But you know, in those days, that's the way it was. So, so, so that one actually uh, was the final, the final uh, invention that I made that allowed them to uh, to make two phase. Uh, 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 logic circuits uh, very effectively, very effectively, where you you could gate special special pass transistors that uh, otherwise you couldn't do. Okay. And, you know, it's too complicated to explain in yeah. few, a few seconds. But uh, basically, that was the last piece missing. And of course, at, at, at that point, I wanted to design the most complex circuits possible using the technology that I had invented. So, and so I I, I look for a, you know for a job because Fairchild after after uh, Noyce and Moore, uh, they were the, uh, the co-founders of, of Intel, left Fairchild. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Moore was the head of the, of the R&D lab and, and uh, Bob Noyce was the, uh, the head of the division, the semiconductor division of Fairchild. When they left, uh, uh, they brought a bunch of people with them and, 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 uh, and they created a fair amount of problems within, within Fairchild. They started, okay. you know, they started taking a lot of the good people and uh, the company was, you know, was not doing it so well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, and uh, um, so I decided that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, and also I figured that, uh, that that Intel was going to use the silicon gate uh, technology because it was the most advanced technology uh, uh, available. And in fact, my boss was one of the first people to leave <laughs> and join Intel. Yes, but as was the name of my boss, and uh, he uh, he was. Uh, friend of uh, Andy Grove, and Andy Grove was uh, one of the first people that were hired at, at Intel. So I mean, that was, that was the, beginning, the yeah. beginning of Intel, and uh, uh, so I asked, uh, I asked Badez to, um, you know, uh, if uh, he had a job for me um, in, you know, in uh, design, because at that point, uh, by the time I, you know, I decided, uh, uh, Intel had already announced a product using the silicon gate technology mm -hmm. called the 1101, the first, uh, the first uh, um, static memory in production, mm -hmm. um, uh, 256 bits. Okay. Imagine 256 yeah. <laughs> bits. Today you have 256 gigabits mm -hmm. in one chip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's that. That was the best that could be done in those days. Yeah. So. 
Uh, so anyway, so that's that's how that's how I decided you know I decided to uh, to move beyond silicon gate using it as yeah. a you know as a for, for designing complex circuits, and I went to Intel. Okay. That's that's that the you know that was the, yeah. the the move that then got me to design the first microprocessor. Yeah. yeah. And did you have a sense for the magnitude of what you had done at that time? Did you see how it impact the trajectory of technological development? Yeah, I, I, yeah, you know, when you have something that is ten times better than something else, yeah. I mean, you, you got you got something, right? I mean, I was a kid, but still, you know, I was not stupid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was that scary to you to realize that, or was it just thrilling? No, I mean, it was, it was a matter, for me, it was a matter of fact. I mean, you know, yeah. so that's yeah. the way it is, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to do to do the best thing you can, you got to use this technology because yeah. you have removed all of the elements that that were against you. In the prior technology, you know, the the other thing that was essential was the leakage current because you could clean up the old the old system, the old wafer uh, of impurities after you have created the fundamental structures. Okay. You know, so they were already sealed. You could clean them up. Then the the leakage current uh, could be reduced by a factor of two orders of magnitude, more than a hundred times. Oh, wow. And that was okay. fundamental to make dynamic circuits yeah. because in dynamic circuits you store uh, you store some charge in a, in a capacitor that leaks away, that charge leaks away and so you you know if it leaks away too too fast you know you you cannot have a, a working circuit yeah. so that's as simple as that. Yeah. So so that was a major major uh, coup that allowed all the dynamic memories all the dynamic circuits that we were doing in those days they could have a Decent mean frequency of operation, mm -hmm. and so that 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 was the foundation of uh, of all of the microelectronics. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, as I said, uh, like ten years ago, a uh, hundred percent of all the the, uh, the circuits in production used silicon gate technology. Just about 98 percent, because yeah. bipolar had disappeared. You know, uh, bipolar was the technology that was used uh, when I when I started. Uh, all the integrated circuit use a different type of transistor than the MOS transistor. It was called bipolar transistor. Okay. And uh, and the bipolar transistors, uh, you know, were power hungry. They were much faster than MOS, but they used too much power. Okay. And, you know, so the speed power product was not as good as MOS. Okay. And and with silicon gate, then uh, that factor of ten really uh, really improved dramatically in that speed power product, and eventually. The uh, MOS technology wiped out almost oh. completely the bipolar devices. Okay. Yeah. So wow. the, you know, so that basically in the, the you know the last uh, the last twenty years, uh, actually the last probably thirty years, bipolar technologies you know has been abandoned essentially. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so you only use for special applications. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And shifting gears a little bit, yeah. I'd like to ask you about. Um, your efforts to fund the study of consciousness through the Federico and Elvia <laughs> Fajin Foundation. It's, yeah. it's so interesting to me that you're so um, accomplished in a very technological realm and then completely switching to a, a very different sort of more, more philosophical realm, but you talk about how your um, fascination for, um, or maybe desire to make a conscious computer sort mm -hmm. of um, propelled your study yes. of consciousness. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to make uh, a computer that rivals human consciousness. Yeah. Do you think that's even possible? No, it's not. Yeah. But but you know, let's get there a step at a time because yeah. it's not obvious. Yeah. Um, particularly because you know, in a materialistic uh, world view, uh, people believe that consciousness is an epiphenomenon mm -hmm. of, of the brain. So if you if you take that position, then by definition, it. it Consciousness is a product of matter, mm -hmm. and, and if it is a product of matter, then obviously if you, you can you ought to be able to make a structure of matter that yeah. is also conscious. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's only logical. But the problem is that uh, the idea that only matter exists is challenged by the existence of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Nobody can explain why yeah. consciousness yeah. exists. As a product of matter, yeah. you know, <laughs> physics, you know, neuroscientists, yeah. nobody has been able to explain how consciousness can arise if you have atoms banging against each other. How, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so, I believe that we need to start from a different, different 
starting point. Yeah. But well, I'll get there. But let me finish. Let me get you tell you a few things about how I got there. Because, yeah, yeah. Because there is, a, there, is a, there is a thread okay. between you know, Silicon Gate and the study of consciousness. Yeah. And the threat is, of course, that uh, computers uh, have really demonstrated the power of the mind by allowing us to essentially duplicate our understanding, our comprehension of, mm -hmm. uh, of structures by converting them into algorithms that are run in a computer. Mm -hmm. So the computer is mimicking what the, our mind does. And before computers, you know, people were not thinking that, that you could build structures that appear to have reason mm -hmm. or appear to have uh, intelligent behavior like computers today. Um, so, so that brought me to the question of how does the brain work? Everybody claims that the brain is like a computer, but it's actually not. Uh, the like is not true. It is an information processing device for sure, but it is not like a, a computer at all. We don't know where the memory is. There's certainly there is no program in the way that we have programmed computers. Uh, it, it certainly it's not digital. There are, there are digital phenomena, but there are many analog phenomena. So, I mean, it's a much, much more complex structure. And so, it, in the, in the mid-80s, there was an interest in neural networks. And so after I started another my first company, which was Zilog. Yeah. Zilog was the you know was the company that started at the end of seventy four, and and uh, it, it was the first company in the world entirely dedicated to microprocessors, and uh, it was my foray into the world of business because after developing the first microprocessor and, and all the first generation and second generation of microprocessors at uh, at Intel. Uh, I decided to uh, to start my own company, partly because uh, Intel was mo more interested in memories than in microprocessors, mm -hmm. and, and I, I felt that the future was in microprocessors. So, so, uh, so I did that. And there we uh, developed. I came up with the idea of the Z80, and I was, uh, you know, I was the directed the, the, the whole project, and the Z80 was, uh, you know, became a very, you know, very widely. Uh, use microprocessor. In fact, it is still in high volume production today. It was introduced exactly 40 years ago. Yeah. It's still being produced by the hundreds of millions yeah. a year today. But um, so the uh, as I work in that area, uh, of course, I got to learn a lot about myself, myself in you know in relationship to managing a company because one thing is to run a project one thing is to you know mm -hmm. start a company and managing it and growing it and so on so so that was also part of this thread that connects me to consciousness then i got i started to be interested in uh, uh, in neural networks and uh, started another company uh, uh, in the mid 80s uh, called uh, called synaptics mm -hmm. that's the company that developed the the early touch pads and touch screens, yeah. which are now yeah. are used everywhere. Uh, uh, the company is, uh, is, you know, is a, a public company now, right now and uh, is doing quite well. At any rate, um, the start of that company was about making, in, uh, making learning systems because neural network promise to be able to actually do pattern recognition, for example, very effectively, much better than we knew how to do with conventional, conventional top-down techniques. Yeah. What is, you know, in those days was uh, artificial intelligence. So I got interested. I got interested in uh, in neuro neuroscience because I needed to understand a little more about how the brain works if we wanted to do something mm -hmm. that was similar to what the brain seemed to be doing. Uh, and so I studied for for. Four or five years, I studied uh, biology and neuroscience because that, that was not my background, mm -hmm. so I needed to understand what was going on. Yeah. But toward the end of that period, I said, well, what about consciousness? And no, nobody talks about consciousness. I mean, that seemed, to, to me seems to be the most interesting thing that a, that a, that a brain does, because in those mm -hmm. days I thought that, it, like everybody else, that the brain is the one that actually produces consciousness. And so I said, how would I do 
a conscious computer. How, how could I do that? Yeah. Okay? And the more I thought about it, the more impossible the task appeared. I read a lot, of, you know, a lot about consciousness. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody really uh, was even you know, attempting to, to explain how feelings, because consciousness is about feeling, mm -hmm. is about the experience through feelings the experience of the outer world, the external world, the experience of our internal world, the experience, uh, you know, the experience of our own self-knowing, and on it goes. So that's how we know, or we know that we know, yeah. or we know that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing yeah. is based on consciousness. It, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, a machine doesn't know that it knows, mm -hmm. or it doesn't know that it doesn't know. A machine is simply a Action reaction mechanism that moves according to a program. The machine can also learn, but the learning is very limited. Okay? So it can only learn to do a better task at the task that you have the, the, the machine to do. Mm -hmm. okay? But we, we are able to look up and ask questions what are those points of light up in the sky? Yeah. Okay? The computer, you know. If you if 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 he asks a question, is because you you put in this in his memory to ask that question, yeah. but he doesn't understand yeah. what he's talking about. Okay, so comprehension, feelings, and comprehension based on feelings. Feelings provide the background of knowledge. Comprehension is finding how that knowledge, the pieces of that knowledge, are interconnected. Finding a pattern inside a pattern. Mm -hmm. That is what consciousness is for. So we, you know, not only that, but is what makes life worth living. If you, yeah. if you don't have consciousness, you, you, you have no joy, no pain, no, no nothing, no experience. I mean, this, you have just a, a, you know, an auto, 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 uh, automatic, yeah. uh, I was going to say automaton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are an automaton, right? Moving according to whatever, you know, the mechanism of your automatic movement is yeah. you have you have no self consciousness you have nothing so so uh, and, and and so the question then is how come that uh, you know that you know we our body appear to be machines and how come that we you know we can be conscious well because even our body is not really a machine okay if you if if you look at a living cell. A living cell, uh, and of course, we are built of, in our case, you know, trillions of living cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so, you know, each living cell is actually a quantum system. If you ask yourself, you know, you probably have heard these days uh, people talk about making a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. A quantum computer is a computer that instead of using bits, ones and zero, you know, the Boolean logic bits of all the digital uh, machines that we build, uh, instead of using bits, they use what are called qubits. A qubit is actually a the superposition of zero and one into a qubit, which as an infinity of values between zero and one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So something like this apparently does computation, and you can do computation with using qubits, and then you get the answer when you collapse the wave function, as they say in quantum physics, and you get the answer in our three the three space dimension plus one time dimension yeah. in our world. But the actual computation cannot be done in this world. It has to be done somewhere else. Okay. So where where else can it be done? Yeah. Okay. Well, physicists don't know the answer. They they know that it works, so they are trying to apply you know the the, the uh, theory quantum physics uh, quantum physics and the various technologies to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm convinced they will be able to do it. But from the expla explanatory point of view, they have no explanation. Yeah. So there has to be some reality behind the reality of the physical world, which is a Boolean reality. Here you have zero or one. Yeah. You cannot have 
a little bit of this, a little bit of that, which is the qubit. Okay? Okay. But the computation can be done, if you have qubits, can be done in parallel in all the possible combinations of states that a, 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 a computer might have. Therefore, you can do computations that are exponentially faster than the computation that you can do with the standard computer. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. but, that, but that computation is not done in this physical world. It is done in some other physical world, which is beneath, underneath, supports this physical world, this 3 plus 1 reality. Okay? So this is what quantum physics is telling us, even if we don't really understand it to the, to the very bottom. So consciousness, as far as I'm concerned, exists in that other reality where you can do quantum computation. In fact, it may, res it may exist, in my opinion, it exists in a reality which is even deeper than that. Yeah. Under, you know, underneath all of the reality, all of the physical realities, and the physical realities emerge out of consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is a fundamental property of nature, mm -hmm. of reality, of the world, before matter. In other words, yeah. it is yeah. consciousness that creates matter instead of the other way around. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, I started a foundation. Uh, you already mentioned Federico and the Jim Foundation for the study of consciousness. Uh, this is not a philosophical study of consciousness. It's actually a, it's a, it's an exercise in physics, okay. trying to develop a new physics starting with cognitive principles instead of materialistic principles. Physics started with the idea that only matter, space, and time, and matter exist. And energy, of course, but energy and matter, as you know, are two facets, mm -hmm. two faces of the same coin. So, if, if we start with the idea that there is only one energy, the same energy that produced space, time, and matter in the Big Bang, right? You know, the most favorite uh, theory of, of physics of the creation of this physical universe. Suppose that this energy of which everything is made is also conscious, is also aware. Okay? What happens? Okay? All of a sudden, awareness or consciousness is the foundational property is the cognitive property. So if you start with that, you develop physics by starting with this energy, so you don't have to put consciousness back later as a, as an afterthought, but consciousness is there from the beginning. Okay? So from the beginning there is purpose and meaning in the universe, which of course there is no purpose or meaning to a theory, a materialistic theory. You know, physics only tells you that all that matters is randomness. Everything happens by random, random events which eventually conjure up to create this world. Well, that doesn't make much sense. Doesn't make much sense because it is, you know, think about a computer. Can a computer arise out of randomness? It self-assembles, it figures out how to do it. I mean, that, that's nonsense, okay? It happens through a process of trial and error variations and selections, which are guided by human consciousness. So all of a sudden you see that there is a possibility that even this universe is created by a process of you know, variations and selections that are controlled yeah. by a, the vaster consciousness of this energy of which everything is made. It's like the, it's a fabric of our universe, is what you're saying. It's a very fabric. It's, it's the is stuff made. of which is made. Yeah, yeah. So matter is simply a manifestation, a particular man dynamic manifestation of this energy of which everything is made. Mm -hmm. And so matter is per force also conscious. But obviously we are a very complex structure of matter. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we are a complex structure of matter made of cells, and cells are conscious, and, and they can support consciousness because they are quantum systems. Mm -hmm. The atoms and molecules inside a cell interact as waves, not as particles. They also appear as particles, but they are fundamental interaction, particularly the interactions that are related to consciousness, are interactions that are quantum mechanical, meaning mm -hmm. 
they depend on the wave properties of matter. But this can't be proven from an external perspective right now, you're saying. It's, well, I mean, it's hard to, we can't prove with what we have. Well, I mean, you know, I, I want to arrive at, at, at proving that it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, yeah. You cannot, you, you cannot, see, you cannot prove that matter is the foundation of everything either. Yeah. You, you take that as a pre presupposition, I mean, an assumption, a postulate, okay? So if you take matter is the beginning of everything, and you derive everything else, then per force, consciousness is, 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 is produced by matter. That, yeah. That's how science works, that's how mathematics works. You have to make some assumptions, and then you derive logically the consequences. Mm -hmm. okay? If we assume that consciousness is primary, then I got to show how matter arises out of consciousness. You know, physicists cannot prove that consciousness arises out of matter. Because they cannot, they cannot show any evidence that feelings can be produced by matter. And feelings are the, the fundamental manifestation of consciousness, the cognitive manifestation, because feelings are the way we know. When you know, how do you know? You know because you feel so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, you know, yeah. that, you know, I look outside and I see trees and so on. Uh, you know, those trees actually are, they're not out there per se. I don't know what's out there. Because all that I, all that I believe is out there is what I have, I have constructed in my brain yeah. through this, yeah, the, 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 the sensory brain system. Mm -hmm. So it is actually a construction. There is all kinds of stuff out there which I do not perceive. Other, other Beings may perceive the other stuff and not even see trees. They see something else. So that's how reality is constructed. It's, it's, it's actually a, in, in a large part, is an illusion of our information processing. And certainly, I feel reality, I perceive reality out there, but even that is a projection because reality, I have constructed it in my brain. So even if we say that brain contains everything, well, that reality out there is actually in my brain, and it is a projection of something else out there projected into the brain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you end up in a... But it's not solipsism, because there is something out there, but, it's not, but it is not the something that we believe we see when we look outside. Mm -hmm. There's only one of an infinite way of looking at the reality which is out there the bottom reality. The bottom reality is essentially unknowable uh, because, because we can only know what we perceive. If we put instruments, even the very instruments that we put are designed by us based on our pre, pre you know, based on what we believe that we probably we might find out there. So, yeah. so we, it, we are inside a box. Now, that box can be enlarged little by little, yeah. but we're still <laughs> inside a box. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, well you described that physics can't, can't really explain feelings, like do you think that there's, there's a limitation with science in explaining these phenomena or do you think that if you just keep you know, chipping away at it there will be some sort of explanation that you're describing? Well, the, you know, if you start with the idea that uh, you start with this energy uh, which is, uh, uh, of which everything is made, which is conscious, uh, then all that exists is this energy, right? Mm -hmm. Now this energy then, uh, being conscious, has the ability to know. And what is there to know, if not to know itself? That is, that's all there is there, right? So you got to know. So, so, so you start with the, this postulate that the fundamental purpose of everything that exists is for consciousness, to know itself. Mm -hmm. That that's, makes sense. So if that is the purpose and you ascribe power you know, or capacities of that energy which are not non unlimited, well then, that's another assumption, then it will never, it will never, conscious will never be able to know completely itself. There is only something new to know about itself. And of course, if we look at reality, you know the way the way you know the way we perceive it based on what we know uh, 
what science has revealed to us, we see that the, the unbelievable creativity and complexity of reality. So, you know, and if this is just one of the many universes now that, that the multiverse is in vogue, yeah. is beginning to get in vogue, right? Then, then man, I mean, we are talking about, uh, you know, potentially being at this forever, right? Yeah. So, yeah. whether that is true or not, whether even time exists within, you know, in that, at the level of that energy. In fact, you know, time, it, it is again a, the, the proper, uh, the proper thing to say that time and space, the way we understand it in our, you know, in our experience here, are not necessarily what have to exist where this energy exists. You know, so it exists in its own space and in, in its own time that had nothing to do with the space and time that we perceive in, in this world. In fact, even the time and space that we perceive ourselves is limited by very narrow frequencies of light, or, or the ability to, to, to pr process information and so on. So, I mean, we, we only experience certain dimensions of time, certain dimensions of space. Okay? Yeah. So, so, you know, um, so it is sensible to say that this process of knowing itself, of consciousness, is lasting forever. There is never an end to it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because there is always something new to discover. Besides, and this now we get we get into you know details that, that probably should be left out, otherwise it gets more and more complicated. But mm -hmm. but basically this consciousness is not is not a flat thing. It is it is structure itself. In other words, the structure of the physical world is a reflection of an inherent structure of consciousness. Because if if Consciousness creates the physical world. Yeah. The it creates something that emerges from itself. So the structure that you see in the physical world has to be somehow reflected in an internal structure of, of consciousness, right? Of this energy. Mm -hmm. So the you know the uh, um, uh, the uh, layer layer or uh, structure of the world where you have you know you have. Uh, you know, elementary particles and, and then, uh, you know, atoms and then molecules and molecules of molecules and on and on. And on. So, so this hierarchical structure that we see in, uh, you know, in, in the physical world has to be reflected into a hierarchical structures of consciousness and therefore each level in the hierarchy has to have different selves. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, consciousness by being able to know itself, knows itself as a hierarchical structure, and on it goes. So you can yeah. see how, how you know, quickly you, you, you can create a, a theory, so to speak, that begins to explain its explanatory power, which is very strong, because, because already in this theory, you already have model for, for, for now, is a theory when, you, you know, it's proven mathematically and makes predictions that are verifiable. But, but this model allows you to explain the reality that we observe in a much more satisfactory way. Instead of explaining only the outer aspects, you also explain the inner aspects. And you explain how the inner aspects are connected with the outer aspects, which now physics cannot, 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 cannot do anything yeah. about it. Yeah. You know, because they have been excluded a priori by, the, by starting with the idea that only matter exists. If only matter exists, you know, you have, you've got to be able to probe inside the brain and see a yeah. thought and, and see a thought. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you cannot. You you only can see correlates of a thought. The thought does not exist in the brain. Because the thought, if you think a second, is actually a feeling. A thought is an image that immediately gets translated into words. You you do that so automatically that you don't even pay attention to the feeling. But it is that feeling, the one that makes you translate the thought into words, and the words are only symbols of something deeper. The outer world is only a world of symbols. The inner world is where reality, where ontology is. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you start yeah. with cognitive principles instead of materialistic principle, 
you start by materialistic principle, there is only outside. There is nothing inside. Therefore, we are machines. Yeah. yeah. Now, you pick which one you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think that this... You, you describe that the, the, the purpose of the universe is to know itself via consciousness, correct? The, that the purpose of consciousness is to know itself. Okay. okay, okay. And the universe is built out of consciousness. Okay, okay. Because this energy produces structures out of itself, which we then perceive through our body, perceive as the world. Yeah. You see? Does that, do you ascribe that to more on a micro level, like the human search for meaning, do you think that this, does this have sort of any, any answer to that question? Do you, do you of course, that? Of is course. That, is that the of, human search for meaning to, to know itself? Of course. Consciousness? I mean, but, but why, you know, do you think the machine, you know, yeah. has an inner search of meaning? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, it may say the words because you, you put them in memory, the yeah. programmer, which is a human being that understands what meaning is. Yeah through his own inner, true inner experience, mm -hmm. you know, then you make machines which are imitation of yourself, and they say the words, which are only symbols, but there is no meaning behind, because meaning resides in consciousness. It is consciousness that gives meaning to our life. So do you think, we might be able to answer this question finally, do you think that the meaning of life is for like a human being to know itself to know via itself. consciousness? Yes. That, well, it's done. It's answered. <laughs> That's, no, yeah. no, because no, because you want to, you know, to know means to actually experience yourself. Okay. It, knowledge is not about symbols. It is about experience. Yeah. So to know yourself, you have to experience yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. I mean, you don't, yeah. you know, you go to school to get knowledge. Knowledge is symbolic. If you cannot, if you don't understand, you repeat the words. You get even an A if you repeat the words. You didn't understand a, a, a damn thing of what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Okay, you still get an A because people don't put the emphasis on the meaning. They put emphasis on knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about meaning. I'm talking about what you actually see about yourself, and that you can only have through a experience yeah okay yeah. it's like I can describe an apple to you you never eaten an apple I can spend thousands of words you will never understand what I mean when I describe the taste of an apple until you taste the apple mm -hmm. when you taste the apple now you understand what I said but before you could not recreate the, the feeling the experience of, of eating an apple by my description of the taste of an apple. Yeah. yeah. You would imagine it, you would, you, would, you, would, you would try to figure out what I'm saying, but it is completely different than actually tasting it. Tasting it. Yeah. You know, we live inside of reality, not outside watching reality from the outside, like physics looks at the observer that looks outside like God looking at stuff happening under your eye. No, yeah. we are immersed in reality, we are part of reality, and our experience in that reality, inside that reality, is what is about. Yeah. That's how we know ourselves. Yeah. Do you think that that is something that can, is it, would that be a negative thing if that sort of power, if, if we are, if it was, you know, probable or possible to make a conscious computer, do you think that that would be is that quality meant to be uniquely human, do you think? That is a quality, no, no, that quality, I mean, you know, even atoms and molecules are, are yeah. you know, are, are conscious, but in their own way, you know, we have no idea of what, of what it means for, say, an electron to be conscious. Mm -hmm. But for one thing, one thing I can say for sure, not for sure, but very likely, is that there is only one consciousness for all the electrons that exist. There isn't like an electron is conscious and this consciousness is different okay. than another yeah. electron. Yeah. The electrons are all identical. In fact, they obey a special statistical uh, uh, behavior called Fermi Dirac okay. statistics that arises out of the fact that you cannot distinguish one electron from another. So electrons are completely indistinguishable, therefore, they have to be one. So there is only one electron that, you know 
scurries around all this reality, but is only one self, one identity. Okay? So, so, so what I'm saying is that you can see right, right in, in this that, that we have to be careful about applying uh, this view to physical things like panpsychism would do, you know, where they, they sort of they paint, uh, you know, everything is conscious, blah, 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 and then that, that ends there, you know, I mean, come on, you know, they, they, you know I'm talking about creating a model which actually is reflected into the physical world because the physical world arises, as I said earlier, from that consciousness, and so from the in inner structure of that consciousness. So it better it better be you know it better be able to explain not not just a, you know just a, you know a bland thing. So what I'm talking about is not the classical panpsychism at all. It's actually I don't even I don't know I'm not a philosopher so I don't I don't invent words yeah. very easily but <laughs> but it's something else okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 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 basically uh, I'm I'm talking about a. Consciousness as uh, being something um, that requires uh, much more work in order to be able to to, to really mm -hmm. you know disambiguate many yeah. of the wrong impressions that we have based on all the theories, all these yeah. big, the things that people have said, and so on. So we have to start basically fresh. It's a fresh okay. start with the cognitive principle. A few cognitive principles, and then seeing where, where we go, and then going back and maybe adjusting a little bit the, the principles, you know, fine fine tuning the principles and going and so on, and fundamentally developing a new physics, which has to have the same evidence, prove you know the, the same predictions that we already have you know tested, but then many new predictions, which are not made by the current theories, and that prove that that approach is better is closer to the truth than starting with matter. Yeah. That's it. Because I don't believe that, that you know, in a hundred years we'll, we'll, we'll know everything there is to know even if you start with cognitive principles. Yeah. Because, because you know, we go step by step and we find, you know, we go as far as we can, then we have to retrace our steps and yeah. change a little bit of the assumptions like ha already happens in physics many times. Quantum physics was a retracing you know, many assumptions about the nature of reality that um, were made in classical physics. And so is general, general relativity or special relativity. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the nature of space and time that Newton had, uh, or Galileo had, completely different in general relativity. And the nature of matter that Democritus and classical physics had, completely different than what quantum physics is revealing. So, the same thing here. I mean, the same thing if we start this in, in this different way, yeah. okay, we'll go up to a, up to a point. You know, we go beyond uh, you know the, the physics that we know today, but then we'll we'll reach some limitations which are containing some little tiny things that are wrong in the assumptions, mm -hmm. and so so it goes. Yeah, because the same process of discovery that we do while living inside matter that I was mentioning earlier. In some other ways, physicists do by looking at matter from the outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's a complementary view from the view from inside. Mm -hmm. And the richer, the richer experience is not the experience of looking at the world from outside, but it's living inside the world, which is only possible by conscious beings. Mm -hmm. And a computer may have. Conscious atoms and molecules may have conscious crystals, you know, as crystals, but the computer is not aware that is, you know, of these elements that are switching inside. It doesn't, you know, that 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 is a cons human construction. It's a human construction because what is a one and what is a zero is a mental construct, mm -hmm. and so and, and 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 the computer is only good to repeat in some ways what we put in. And to explore the boundaries with you know levels of learning which are compared to what we do elementary, explore the boundaries of what we put into that computer. Yeah. But that exploration is mechanical, is not conscious. Uh, in other words, we can do that because we rely and we build up on 
the capacity of quantum systems, like the cells that we are composed of, quantum systems, to support a level of consciousness which is infinitely larger than a system entirely built of 3 plus 1 mm -hmm. matter, which is Boolean matter. Boolean matter does not, doesn't allow you to have consciousness out of the creations of the combinations of Boolean matter. But because, because consciousness relies on the quantum aspects of reality, it is in the connecting, the pieces that connect matter with each other. It exists at that level. It exists in the wave property of electrons. Now when an electron appears here, you know, that, that, that is a you know, that is an event in 3 plus 1, but that event, this larger event, was behind the 3 plus 1, was in that space that I was mentioning earlier, where you do quantum computation, that exists underneath the 3 plus 1, which is the reality that we think exists. Okay? So the mystery is there, and it's the same mystery why quantum physics cannot explain the measurement problem. It's the same mystery. Because it is connected with the fact that we do not we, we, we do not understand how the collapse of the wave function occur. Nobody can. How can you exist, stuff exists in the so-called Hilbert space, which is this space of, you know, n-dimensional, where n can be even infinite, and where you have stuff happening, and then, you know, and then there is a collapse of the wave function that manifests a, one of the many states in which a system can, can exist manifest that state in our reality. That, that's how physics explains it, but it, it's not an explanation, really, because the theory does not tell you when and how that collapse of the wave function occurs. Mm -hmm. So there is something magic that happens. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And what does it? Nobody knows. Okay? So, this model that I'm talking about sits right there, at, you know, in, in that mystery, okay? And in time, because I've been at it seriously, you know, like a, my only job yeah. uh, for three, four years. I mean, I, I've been, you know, thinking about it for 30 years, but, but in terms of putting all of my energy into this direction, it's been, you know, three years ago. Yeah. So I've been, I've been uh, you know, quite, quite active right now, but, yeah. uh, but you know, so I, I you know, the, the ability to to understand deep, more deeply and explain more deeply uh, is going to, to grow in time because of this energy that I'm putting into mm -hmm. it. So. How do you feel that you've been able to free yourself from the framework, uh, scientific framework, just a social framework to make these groundbreaking discoveries or, you know, just to think these sort of thoughts? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think it, it's, so, it's so revolutionary in the way you're addressing mm -hmm. it. And you're talking about a complete you know, reframing of mm -hmm. the system that we think our universe is built yeah. off of. Yeah. How do you, do you think you've had that ability your whole life? How do you think you've been able to do that? Um, that that's a very perceptive question, actually. Um, most people will not think that. Um, in fact, it was the hardest thing to do, to, mm -hmm. to uh, free myself of a certain way uh, of looking at reality, which was what I, I learned in school, you know, I learned I mean, that's what physics tells you is done this way, and so yeah. you you kind of you know take it take it as as uh, as the truth. Federico explains that spontaneously he enters into states of consciousness that give him insight into what he's studying. So he knows that it's true, and no one can take that away from him because he's experienced that. And he says that this is because he had such a strong and continues to have such a strong desire to understand consciousness. And he thinks that being in that state of mind has allowed him to have those experiences. I asked Federico how his study of consciousness, how his view that external reality is just an illusion of the senses, has impacted the way that he lives his daily life. Because I was thinking, if you view the outside world as a trick of the senses, doesn't that make your day-to-day -day life seem kind of kind of fake, I feel like it would weigh him down a little bit, but he said it's quite the opposite. You, you function better because you see, you know, you, you perceive the world in a different way, mm -hmm. in, a, in a completely different way than the way, I certainly perceive the world in a completely different way, I mm -hmm. perceived it when I was wedded to okay. this worldview that I had learned, oh, okay. you see. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, you're much lighter because you know yeah. that it's a game. You know, so you play the game. Oh, you see I, I mean? love, I yeah. love that answer. And that is that you t you take things less seriously in, in general. Yeah. That's so interesting. I would have thought it would have been the opposite. Of course, no. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. no. Because you know, say so you you. I mean, you you see the the, the you know, illusion almost the, the is, illusion yeah. and the irony of yeah. it, you know? <laughs> and the fact that before you thought that it was this way, and now you uh -huh. can see more clearly that this is not. Yeah. Okay? You still don't understand it all, not that we understand yeah. me, but yeah, yeah. but you you pretty much got the gist of it, which is really you are yeah. inside a game, you know, you are playing a game, but it's a is a real is a is an important game. It is mm -hmm. a fundamental game. So it's, it isn't like a game. Therefore, you can toss it away. Yeah. No, no, no. Actually. Actually, before, when I was wedded to a certain worldview, there was a, there was more sense of unreality at that time than there is now, because now I see myself inside the game. Okay. Where before I didn't I didn't not, I, you know it was it, it was even frustrating you know not to understand but what's 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 going on here you know because. I still was asking questions that were more philosophical, you know, yeah. than say how does this work or you know what equation do I apply here, uh, and, and so that part was I had to disconnect that part almost completely mm -hmm. and disconnect myself from my own feelings, in order to live in that world that was deprived of any of any meaning really, so I, I had to let go of stuff inside of me because they were illusory anyway. Now, when you see the other way around, that, that stuff is actually not illusory, and what is illusory, what you thought it was the only real stuff, that is actually you smile. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I've heard, I would think that that would uh, lend itself to being quite nihilistic in a lot of ways. Just it, interesting because you're saying it doesn't matter, but that, that does bring a whole, a whole new recognition of what does matter. No, I mean, yeah. that's right. I yeah. mean, it, it's, it's, it would be nihilistic if you, you know, if, if you think that. The inner world is illusory, like you, they were telling you before. If you yeah. think that that world is illusory, yeah. okay, then there is illusion out. Illusion is that the whole thing mm -hmm. is illusion. Therefore, that's nihilism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And nothing make nothing exists. You know. Yeah. Basically, that's silly, right? You know, obviously there is something. You know, but that something is not what we think it is. That's what I'm saying. There is something that something is not even close to what we think yeah. it is. Okay, and so now is the pleasure of discovering what <laughs> is it? You know what is it? You know out here, now there. Yeah. That is not like you know how would it work? How you know how mm -hmm. can I explain it? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's an incredible game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> I'm really interested in in how how do you. With all of that in mind, and this is sort of a, it's sort of an interesting question to bring back to. How do you define success in your own life? With all that in mind, is it is it just the, the passion for discovery, or is it actually making a concrete sort of you know product? To, or to, to me, success in my life, and I haven't reached that yet. Um, it's not what people tell you the success is. Is you having a ball in your life, mm -hmm. okay? You enjoy your life from the inside, from your own feeling, mm -hmm. seeing your living as a adventure. Every day, every moment is, is something new. Going with it, embodying your life, you see? Mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of, you know, ex you know moving, moving up into your head and just being a thinking, you know, a thinking thing, yeah. you know, just living fully in the physical, in the emotional, in the mental, and in the spiritual level. Mm -hmm. We have all these levels to be sort of, you know, live through completely as much as you can. Mm -hmm. That's what a successful life is to me. I would not have defined that at all. Like you know, the same, yeah, way, the same way thirty years ago. Okay. But now I see clearly, and so I also can now test myself: Am I really, you know, you know, mm -hmm. do I really have a ball? No. And if you're honest with yourself, you say, yeah. "Well, I, you know, not now." Or you know, yeah. or I had 
you know, a few moments where I really, I really was into it, mm -hmm. okay? But in a way, in a way, you know, a, 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 a child is more into what I'm talking about mm -hmm. than we are, okay? Is that kind of, that kind of trust in life that the child has, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because if you're, if you're fearful that something bad is going to happen to you, you contract, you cannot enjoy life. No way you can enjoy that. Mm -hmm. So fear has to go. Now that's a tall order. Yeah. Because we all it's have huge. all kinds of fears. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah. Okay. You deal with that by looking inside, looking at the source of fear within you, understanding it, and as you understand it, not by pretending that it's not there, or putting something on top to cover it up, or enduring it without facing it. So every fear needs to be faced. If you face your fear, you can conquer it. But you conquer it not in the sense of, you know, slaying it. No, fear is energy, is your energy. That's why you cannot, you got to, you got to transform face it. it. Yeah. Face it and transform it because it's energy which is corrupted by misunderstanding. It is basically not understood stuff that you need to, when you understand it, you undo the knots. Yeah. And all yeah. of a sudden, you recover the, your energy, your vital energy, which now is free to enjoy. Oh, wow, okay. It's, a, it's energy that's integral to you. You just need to that's right. re interpret you it. Can, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, you cannot. Oh, that's such know, a cool way of looking at if it. You, if, if you try to kick it away, but, yeah. you know, like yeah, the, the old, most spiritual tradition tell you, you know, that you got to conquer your ego, destroy your ego. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. You need your ego. You're, you're, you know, otherwise, who's going to drive the machine? Yeah. Which is yeah. your body. Your ego has to drive the machine, but it, but it, but it has to do just that. Yeah. Do it well, and let you be also the rest of the, the, what you are mm -hmm. that the ego is not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, it needs to be your friend, yeah. not your enemy. Yeah. Okay. But again, I started by taking, you know, here and there, you know, looking at what people were saying and then testing it inside my own experience. And sometimes it took a while before I said, no, that's wrong. It cannot be because I, that's not, that's, you know, it doesn't stand to in the intellect and the emotions or the, or the, or the mental or the, or the spiritual aspects that I see in myself. So, I, I, you know, let's find out what's going on. Yeah. So that's how you get there. You get there by, by using your life as a mirror of what you're trying to understand. Reflecting to you, you know, a reality which is richer than what you find in the books. Because if, if all you do is to just to understand what people are saying, you never get there from here. Because, you know, different people, you know, feel differently, explain different things to you, yeah, and, and so on. So, you know, so that's, that's it doesn't work. You have to be engaged in your own self-realization. And the rest of it comes for free, so to speak. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, you know, that's what I found for myself. So if I, if I were to stop self-realizing myself, I don't think I could make progress even in my science. I would end up being stuck somewhere because that energy that I don't want to see myself, which is, which is you know, you know, knotted up, that is what also impedes my intellect okay. to see something yeah. new. Yeah. The creativity arises out of that freedom of your consciousness. It, 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 not that consciousness into angers, you know, hatred, fear, and so on, pride, you, you name it, right? Yeah. That will impede you to actually find the truth, even of your, you know, search of how the world works. Yeah. I don't think you can get much better than that. <laughs>